oh, it asked me consent if I wanted it to be recorded. That was very nice of them. <laughs> As it does. Yes, thank you. <laughs> if I accidentally hit leave the webinar, that would not have been good. <laughs> You'll be able to get you back, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd come back. I can't do this one without you. Yeah, well, you know, you could try. Mm, no. Mm, no. <laughs> it's good to know your limits. Yes, that's a, that's a really good piece of advice, actually. <laughs> Here. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll get started in just a moment. I'm going to end my screen share for a moment here. Amazing. And we will begin. All right, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Lexi and I'm the curator at the One Archives at the USC Libraries. And I'm delighted to have Rakim here joining me for the fourth in a series of conversations as part of Safer at Home. For those of you who don't know, although I think many of you joining in have probably heard me say this before, um, but Safer Home is an exhibition which I've been curating, curating in real time, selecting items from the One Archives collection that resonate with and reflect on the idea of Safer at Home. And while the exhibition began, as a way to reflect on the ordinance issued as a response to the coronavirus pandemic, I feel like it now equally applies to the protests in, in response to police brutality. And they, of course, are inseparable. Here in California, COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting marginalized individuals with disproportionate deaths among Black, Latinx, Native, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities, and police are disproportionately killing Black, Brown, and trans individuals across the country. Thus. Safer at Home to me is really a way to think about how do we act, how do we behave, what to do in a world shaped by structural and systemic racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Thinking about in the phrase Safer at Home, whose safety, what home, who defines the home, um, who defines that safety. So to complement these archival selections, I thought it was essential to include the voices of queer of color contemporary LA-based artists in this project, which is why I'm delighted to have Rakim here today. And we're in for a special treat because he's in a studio and it's yeah. going to show a couple of his collages up, up close for us. Um, and that's the closest we'll get until we were able to meet in person. So the sec kind of second half or third half or whatever phase of this project will also include an exhibition in person at the archive when it's safe to do so that will put on view some of the archival selections with the works made by contemporary artists. But for day today, we'll just have to see them through the screen. Um, our conversation will be about 30 to 40 minutes. And if you have any questions for Rakim or for me, um, you can put them in the Q&A box um, through the Zoom and I will try to get them answered. And for those who aren't aware, this conversation is being recorded and will be made available for viewing later for those who have to duck out early or are unable to attend. And now just before we officially launch into some questions, a bit about Rakim. Rakim Cunningham is a multimedia artist and photographer based out of Los Angeles, California. Born in 1992, his work explores the many nuances of the queer Black experience through photography, collage, installation, and video works. Cunningham often incorporates images from manga, anime, comics, and fashion magazines he's consumed during his life, often in an attempt to subvert and identify tropes and stereotypes of Blackness in the media. While Cunningham focuses on queer identity politics, escapism, fantasy, self-acceptance, and the navigation of body politics under the queer landscape, he's also interested in exploration and interaction of materials. Cunningham received his BAFA from UCLA Design and Media Arts Department, yay, and is yay. a member of Monte Vista Projects in Los Angeles. So thank you so much, Rakim, for being here today and for being a part of this project. I'm really excited for our conversation. Um, yeah. To share with everyone here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here, and um, and thank you for everyone that's listening and everyone in the chat. Feel free to ask questions. I'm an open book. I <clears throat> excuse me. I love to talk. <laughs> I love to talk about the work. And yeah, thank you for having me. And I'm excited to dive right in. Perfect. So yeah. I'm sharing my screen in a moment so that folks um, viewing in can see uh, some of your work. And then I thought we could just start with an easy kind of 
maybe you can talk us through the two projects that you've been kind of working on simultaneously or concurrently. I know they started before and are continuing on. So we'll mm -hmm. just do that and I will share my screen. Great. Well, thank you, Lexi, for having me. And again, thank you, everyone in the chat. Um, yeah, for Safer at Home and just kind of in general, I think since um, quarantine has started, I typically kind of do two different types of work. I normally work around um, photography, um, mostly kind of self-portraiture, although I've been kind of experimenting with a few different um, forms of photography and kind of been looking into like what makes a photograph. Um, but also I've been working on these collage pieces that Lexi's kind of having on the screen and going through now. And um, essentially they both kind of deal with two different things. I would, I would say that one of the bodies of work with the collages are more so about um, kind of escapism and using um, the materials and using the content that like I kind of grew up with it to make artwork. So um, outside of the context of quarantine, I've started making the collages because, <clears throat> excuse me, as I've gone to different galleries and gone to different exhibitions and I try to do that like once every two weeks or when we could like try to go to see something once every two weeks and kind of throughout my uh, career and just my life learning about work um, I always felt like I was kind of an outsider to a degree like and I think by that I mean excuse me like as a black queer person going into galleries I would sometimes get looked at funny or I wouldn't understand a lot of the materials and the first time that I went to a gallery was when I got accepted to UCLA and I went to the um, new white gallery that was there and so for me these the collages represent a few different things one it's kind of using the materials and the um, experiences and the media that I consumed growing up to actually make artwork um, and also the things that I'm kind of consuming now in the same way that some people might have had, um, you know, like a um, education in kind of fine art or modernism or that kind of thing. I really kind of grew up with anime and I didn't have a lot of friends. And I remember, you know, like my <laughs> summer after seventh grade, I sat up at the Dell computer that we had upstairs and I like watched all of Naruto and like, you know, that to me was the art of my childhood. That to me were the things that, you know, I got to kind of consume as a kid. And it shaped a lot of the way that I think about, um, I guess my ideals now. So with doing the collage work, I wanted to make things that kind of honor um, the media that I consumed when I was younger and also kind of shed a light on, you know, how people that look like me are actually, and how black people uh, specifically are portrayed in um, media. Also too, how black people have to kind of relate to these characters in media that might not necessarily be black. So some of the collages are only, you know, only have black characters in them. Some of them don't. But it was kind of about how, um, you know, all of those things can be reconciled and how you put those, you know, in kind of one thing like this particular piece, you know, deals a lot with kind of the feeling of being like shit on for lack of a better word. Oh my God, can I cuss? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for lack of a better word, you know, and for kind of being, you know, like attacked for just kind of being who you are. So I wanted to make these collages kind of using the characters and emotions that I feel and how to kind of curate all of those. Um, and then with the photography work, it's kind of almost the opposite in that a lot of my photography work kind of deals with, um, you know, the same kind of things dealing with um, different kind of issues that I face, but I mostly use photography as a way to make these intricate sets and take these self portraits to kind of be a bit more extravagant than I am in, you know, everyday life. So, you know, right now I'm sitting here with like a black t-shirt and shorts and my sandals, but it's like, you know, in the photographs, I can kind of be as over the top as I want to be and kind of create a space for black artists and for people with similar body types or people that have kind of just gone through similar things to express themselves and to be able to do that in a way that is more, I guess, for lack of a better word, like phantasmical and, you know, like, you know, ephemeral because, you know, for example, like in Lord of the Rings, like there are no black elves there, you know? And so it's like, I want to make sets and make things that kind of experiment with that, but also to a lot of the sets and a lot of the photographs kind of reference um, painting and, you know, kind of how like the history of painting has been and like how the black body, I know a lot of people hate that term, but how, you know, how black bodies have kind of been, um, you know, used 
throughout that and I'm kind of making kind of my own history if that makes sense like referencing others but also kind of making my own thing so it's like you know um when I was at UCLA the first kind of uh art movement that I learned about was primitivism which to me like at the time like didn't really ring any bells, but it's like looking back, it's like, you know, the first art I learned about is from black people or native people. And, you know, these items were, uh, you know, colonized and like literally taken. And so it's like, then they're called primitive. And so it's like, what does it look like when I'm trying to make that history and redefine that history for myself and make these sets and spaces that are almost safe spaces for queer people and black people and POC to exist in and what does that feel like in order for you to express your opinion so whether that's me kind of being over the top and confident or whether that's me being you know more sad and um you know dejected like all of those things are kind of valid and I want you know whatever my work is to kind of really um hone in on all of those things and allow black artists especially and black people the humanity that I feel like isn't afforded to us so many times. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll talk about both series. We'll go back to the collage in a minute and then to yeah. the studio photography. But of course, they're not unrelated either. They're both your For body, sure. but also think about performance and identities and, and things like that. But I guess to start, we'll go back to the collage and then we'll move mm -hmm. on. Um, and thinking about something like any of these really, or this one here. Um, yeah. and it's a little more to delve into the process and maybe you can share, um, you know, do you think, do you have a kind of collage in your mind before you start? Do you pick out certain images? Obviously there's a huge body of anime and manga for you to draw upon mm -hmm. names too. And then your own image, which you insert sometimes like here, and this is the one that we use to kind of advertise for today's event as well. Mm -hmm. And people can see me when I talk, right? Yes, so they okay. can see the image and then you in the kind of upper right. Okay, so I can't see myself when I talk, y'all, but I hope you can see this. So this is the piece that Lexi's talking about here. I'm trying to hold it in front of the camera, so I hope you can see You're it. Good job. Um, so this one is called Our Power, and I'll kind of use this as an example as, as to how the um, process kind of works. So typically, yeah, they're small. They're they're 12 by 11. So actually someone commented that they're small. So yeah, they're small in person and there's actually a reason for that. So part of the process was when I'm actually working um, with the collages and you can kind of see behind me the size of them. They're smaller for a few reasons and I'll kind of talk about that in the process. So when I'm working on them, um, typically all of the collages, they're around, if, if you look on the back, they're kind of like this here, very simple. Um, they're typically around 11 inches, um, oops, 11 inches uh, wide by 16 inches tall. And that's because I kind of want them to kind of be in the vein of comic books and manga and manga and things like that. And they're really heavily inspired by that. So um, I actually have, so the way that it works is I have these boxes, like I have tons of boxes and I've been really lucky to be supported by some of these companies like Viz Media and like Crunchyroll have been very supportive. So like I'll get things kind of like this, you know, from them. And what I'll do is I'll look at any kind of given situation or any kind of, you know, idea of what I have. And then I go through and I screenshot um, and or take images from different kind of media that I consume. So um, a lot of the times it's anime screenshots, it's manga screenshots, or I'm sorry, manga pages, um, screenshots from YouTube videos or things like that. Um, but most of it is media that I've consumed. So with this one in particular, you know, this one is called Our Power. And the reason that it's called that is because when I was younger, I was really made fun of a lot, you know, for being queer or being feminine. And I wanted to make a piece that really kind of just, I guess, you know, dived and leaned into that. So, you know, I have, so I essentially made this piece to make my cousin uncomfortable because he was the one that kind of, you know, was super homophobic to me when I was younger. So in the center here, this is actually a screen from Attack on Titan of a guy named Rod Reese. And this was kind of taken at a point where he was trying to manipulate his daughter. And then I was thinking like, okay, this is a face that like I can see a lot of, especially like straight white men make and a lot of like older gay white men will make like when, you know, gays and queer people of color kind of um, take their power back. So I'm just like, okay, what makes, what would make someone like this make this expression? 
So if you go onto the side, you kind of have all of these different things here. So you have me kind of posing like this. These are more so kind of like the stats of what it would kind of feel like when you're feeling really powerful. You know, this is Yuna from Final Fantasy X-2. A lot of people, if you guys that follow my gaming streams, you kind of know this. This is from a um, series called Shin Sakiyori, which really kind of uh, talks about racism, but also talks about like sexuality in a really kind of open and free way. So when I'm doing them, I'm just really thinking like, how can I talk about and explain these ideas in ways that make sense to me in ways um, using characters that I relate to, using characters that I've kind of, um, you know, seen in my life. Um, so the process for them is pretty much I will get the wood, I'll spray paint it, kind of do what I need to do. And I have, other than the, the um, you know, than like the things here, I have a bunch of different kind of um, uh, tubs or like containers that have all kind of different screenshots. So sometimes I spend my days coming home from work and like watching an anime series just so I can see what I'm going to screenshot. And then I'll go take those screenshots and then I print them out and then I'll cut them out and then kind of adhere them to the wood in whatever ways, you know, is like the best. So um, I guess to get up really quick, I'm going to do this really fast. Um, recently, <laughs> recently, I've been working on, um, I just finished watching Evangelion, which is such an amazing show. So, you know, the things kind of start out like this you know, they'll start out kind of like this. They'll start out something like this. And then depending on kind of where I'm at, you know, I'll cut them out and it'll be something like this. And then that kind of makes them. And I find that, and I find it honestly really beautiful because I think a lot of times too, like there's a lot of things I see in anime and animation and in manga that I find really beautiful, but I've tried to think like, how can I honor this, but also talk about my struggle at the same time. So these collages are ways to kind of reconcile those things um, and to really make work that I feel is for me, if that makes sense. Like, I think a lot of the time I've, I've made work and especially with some of my photography work for other people, but these collages are really made for myself. And the fact that people have responded to them is, you know, really um, empowering and I'm really grateful for that. So. I know that asks more, that answers more than what the question asked, but you know. <laughs> I think for those of us who have maybe seen the collages that you've been sharing on Instagram or, or elsewhere, it's great to hear kind of how you put them together and what, what the backstory is, especially yeah. someone like me who doesn't, I don't, I'm not in the anime or game, video game world so much. Mm -hmm. um, but Count your blessings. <laughs> but they, they, <laughs> nonetheless, especially that, I mean, the figure that you showed in the center, kind of the like expression and he, that kind of um, facial expression appears in some of the other collages too and was really really resonated um, even outside of you know the anime kind of television yeah. game like you can even see behind me like the piece that I'm pointing to like it has kind of that same expression and like part of it too has to kind of do with like anxiety and you know like mental health and like what that feels like too and I think that some of these expressions are um and I think that some of these expressions that we see in the pieces like are what people feel like, like the one that's right here. Like I felt like that almost every day of quarantine. It's like, what is going on? You know? And I'm just like, <laughs> and so I wanted to make pieces that kind of, um, you know, like resonated like with that feeling. And if I can find like, and use these exaggerated faces, then, you know, let's go mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. And then when you see it, I'm sure not on yourself, but someone else, then it kind of, helps you make sense of that emotion and then yeah. alone too. I mean, I think that's probably a feeling of like, oh yeah, I, I connect or don't connect in these ways with this, this mm -hmm. person. And then how it gets just in real life, how relationality matters so much, who we're near to, who we're far away from, especially I think it's been heightened during quarantine. Um, right. It makes a lot of sense. Um, maybe before we switch a little more to talk about the studio photography, you could also talk the one, one of the other ones that I love, which is on the Safer at Home exhibition website, is the one that has a kind of mug-like um, format or uh, shape to it. And so mm -hmm. all the other ones you have usually are more or less square with a few things hanging off the edge. So as this green one here, here. Yep, the green one, and I can yeah. Let me go grab it. I'll, I'll bring it up close. Um, so. 
thank you for um, thank you for pointing that out. So this one is actually oh thank you Taylor. Um, I can see all the comments as you guys are talking to all panels. So I appreciate that. Um, so this one here is more of an experiment that I was doing, and I think this is more part of the direction that I want to go to now. Um, in addition to I think you know what I talked about before with like the um, <laughs> my friends are texting me are you drinking wine um I think in addition to kind of um you know the work that I did before and kind of talking about like the you know expressing the ideas through manga um I'm also really interested I think you know in kind of the formal elements of art as well so I'm really much interested in um you know in kind of a lot of these like sculptural forms I'm really interested in texture I'm really interested in color and how those things kind of come about. So this one actually kind of came about in a really weird way. Oh, this is cool because it like turns my face. Um, my, my sister actually is a chef and she cooks a ton almost every day. And so this is actually kind of like a like a holder that she uses for some of her cakes, but she had some kind of scraps left over. And so I asked her if I could use it because I thought the shape was really interesting. So I wanted to do something that was less kind of like cluttered, even though this is still a little bit cluttered. I wanted to do something that was less kind of something like this, where there's a ton of stuff going on, and more something like this, where you kind of had some breathing room. So um, actually, the funny thing is, these X's are actually from an X-Men comic. Um, and I ended up kind of tracing them over some other paper and then spray painting them. Um, but this one kind of came about because I really just wanted to experiment with what it's like to kind of work in form and texture and what it's like to really, um, you know, just kind of do something that felt opposite of what I wanted to do. And the black parts actually come because um, I, I've, I'm pretty vocal about this, but I uh, have, I was diagnosed with OCD last year. Um, and part of how that manifests for myself is kind of scab picking. So I'm sorry, I'm going to show people this, but I'm, I'm going to show you this for a reason. So like, for example, like you can kind of see like stuff here or like stuff here. And the reason that you see that is because like, in order to deal with stress, the way my OCD manifests sometimes is like kind of picking. So I wanted to put something on the piece, I actually finished it. And then I put the black pieces on there because I almost wanted to trigger that feeling of like wanting to scratch it, um, to put myself in a state of anxiety where I can then kind of move like past that. And so um, the experimentation with that particular piece was kind of combining a bunch of different things. And so I sometimes make pieces to challenge myself um, and that was one of them. So I'm not, a, you know, I'm a huge believer in, you know, um, in trying to push yourself to be better, to push yourself to, um, experiment and to not really feel comfortable. So that was one of the pieces where I was like, okay, I'm going to do something where I'm not really familiar with what I'm doing, but I'm going to push a little bit through it. So that's part of the direction that I wanted to work in. Um, and in terms of the concept, it kind of came about because um, if you notice, there's only, uh, there's only really white men on this one. Um, and here it says, we're trash, but we have strong bonds as trash. <laughs> and this kind of came about because I felt at the, the particular time that I was making the piece was that there were a lot of, like, I guess for lack of a better term, there were a lot of white men in my life that I felt were dictating my life. And like, I wanted to make a piece to kind of break out of that and respond to that. So that's kind of how sometimes, you know, I'll come up, go about the pieces. And they're very reactionary sometimes to the things that will happen. So that one was one where I was just like, I wanted to kind of do something else completely different than what I normally do, because I felt I was kind of being put in a box. And I really don't like being put in a box. So that was my way of kind of breaking out of that. Thank you for that explanation. And I think the, the shape is really striking to me. And and formally and structurally, I think maybe this is a good segue now to think a little bit about the studio mm -hmm. photography because that all is about kind of shapes and the shape of the body and the shape of the objects you put. So I'll, I'll share the screen again just so that uh, yeah. we can put some of those up. Here we go. Mm -hmm. We could talk a little bit about kind of a similar the process in making these, especially thinking about kind of form and straight and shape and, and in this series you have the two, I don't know if they're foam or something else. Um, that's something yeah. You know that you're inside of an outside of thinking about inside and outside of the box breaking free kind of becoming contained and i don't know if that was at play 
or something. It was. <laughs> Thank you for noticing. You're the first person to say that, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, it was very much that. Like, um, the, the tubes that you kind of see are these, like, piping things that you can get from Home Depot. And, you know, when I'm selecting materials, I would, like, a lot of the times there's kind of thought that goes behind it. Sometimes I, I think it's good to just listen to your instincts. And so I remember going to Home Depot, like, right in the middle of quarantine, and I had to, like, wait 30 minutes to get in. And I was like, you know... I'm just going to get materials that kind of speak to me. And so the pipes really kind of spoke to me because I wanted to add some kind of, I guess, like depth or texture to the collages. But with this particular work, yeah, I use them in the way of, you know, kind of what it feels like to be put in a box and like what it feels like to kind of like operate within that. So the one on the far left, you know, it's like, you know, there's me posing, it's me posing like very confidently type of thing, but it's also, I'm still like kind of confined like within these spaces and with all of them and with the other three, it's not as confident. It's more so of like a expression of like trying to break out or feeling kind of dejected or feeling not inspired. And um, part of it is because I think as a black artist in particular, like we're put into boxes and we're put into these things so many times where it's like I'm told that you know my work has to look a certain way or my work has to be a certain thing or has to be about a certain topic and I just find that really like limiting and boring for lack of a better term and and I really want to break out of that so part of it was that and then part of it was like physically being stuck in quarantine, you know, and like wanting to kind of be like this sexy, you know, kind of confident person that's on the left, but I'm more so feeling like, you know, the middle on the bottom because it's like, that's kind of where I'm stuck at. you like, I'm stuck at home. Like I can't really leave and go anywhere. You know, I'm not quarantined with my partner. So I can't really see him like as much as I'd like to, you know, I'm not able to go out. I'm not able to see my friends. So what does it feel like like trying to thrive and succeed um, and function, honestly, um, in a limited space, like physically and metaphorically? So that's kind of like where a lot of these came from. Um, and you'll see kind of in the background, there's like the gold, um, you know, like foil balloons and stuff like that, which actually came from my sister's birthday party. And I typically use those when I want to talk about like celebration. But in this, it's, you know, we can't really celebrate. So like, what does that look like? What does that feel like? And then what does it feel like when you're trying to be your best self and you're trying to be your best person, but you have these constraints around you? And that's kind of, you know, with the photography, how these kind of manifested. Um, and I'm happy and, you know, looking forward to continue down that path. I find, I find it really interesting. No, that's good, and I find them really powerful. I know you've done a couple more since since yeah. these things, um, as well. But and thinking too, I guess about um, just being quarantined and the kinds of work that you feel like you're able to make now or need to make now versus can't make now, especially in light of the last couple of weeks and the protests against police brutality, mm -hmm. and the kind of rise of Black Lives Matter and more protests and how all of that has kind of, of course, because none of us live in a vacuum and artists don't create art in a vacuum either, how that has all impacted kind of what you're interested in pursuing um, going forward too. Yeah, I'm, thank you for asking. It, it, it's honestly kind of, this is a harder question for me because it's like, I feel conflicted in a way because a lot of my work deals with like, how black people exist outside of our relationship to the police because i feel so many times like black people are just like and when it comes to black issues and you hear it in politics like it's so much focused on like our relationship to the police and i'm and i don't want to like um minimalize that because we are being killed at like an exponential rate and black trans women are being killed at like an exponential rate that's ridiculous but when I, when this kind of stuff happens, I almost feel like there's this expectation as a black artist that you have where you're supposed to make work that like deals specifically with that and deals specifically with this and deals specifically, you know, with how, you know, police treat black people. And to be honest with you, Lexi, like, I just, I really haven't made that much work since George Floyd has been murdered because I've 
I've been sad, you know, like, I, like I haven't been in, a, in the correct mindset. Like my thought hasn't been how I make work about this time. It's been more of how can I help my people? How can I uplift people? How can I make people laugh? How can I like, how can I get people to feel human kind of during this time? And so I, I felt almost like this pressure to, to make work that like speaks to the moment. But I don't think that that's healthy per se, like if that's not like where you are. So the way I'm kind of thinking about it, and, I'm, and I say that to say, like I think it's frustrating sometimes and limiting as a black artist, like with these photographs in particular, like kind of talking about being in a box when stuff like this happens, because a lot of people look to black artists to be the people to be like, okay, well, what are you saying? What are you commenting? And it's like, I can't end white supremacy, you know, like I can't end police killing black people. Like that's something white people have to do. And so it gets tiring and exhausting to like almost be looked to, to like see how I'm responding when the obvious answer is like, I'm not okay. You know, like this isn't like, this isn't um, like, this isn't a joke. People are being killed. And, you know, I've, I've, I've had a hard time <laughs> trying to make work about this moment because I'm just so, I'm so pissed and I'm depressed about it and I'm angry and I want to be in the streets and I want to protest. And, and I think we have to allow ourselves the ability to be human beings and the ability to like feel those things. So I personally have not felt this huge kind of like like surge of inspiration to make work right now because it's like my people are dying you know and it's like I wish I was able to kind of get it together and you know make work that's like pointing it to the moment but like I'm hurting you know like my my community is hurting my people are hurting and so it's like producing work has believe it or not almost been like the last thing on my mind because it's like how do I get through the day as a human being like, how do I get through without cussing people out? How do I get through the day without like yelling at the people at my job? How do I get through the day without like yelling at my partner? How do I get through the day without having to take, you know, like all of these like extra anxiety medications? Like, how do I do that? And so, yeah, it's just been a really hard time. And I think that with a lot of, in the art world, I'll say this and I'll be done with it. I just think, in the art world, like a lot of people have expected black artists to kind of be these like beacons of like who we should look to. And I want to say to that, like, look to yourself, like, look how you affect racism. Like, instead of calling and texting me about like how I feel and like what I need to do, like, look at yourself, like, look in the mirror, like, you know, are you are you checking your family members? Are you checking the people that, you know, you're close with? Are you checking your friends? And I think that black artists, if anything, should be able to just chill and be a human being and feel everything that's going on. So I applaud the people that are able to create. I'm just not one of them right now because of everything that's going on and like my own mental health. It's just been really difficult. Um, and I guess to answer your actual question, how it's affecting my practice, like, I think moving forward, sorry, I think moving forward, um, I, I, it's things that, like, I think about and I, and I, you know, definitely take into account, but I definitely don't want to be someone who's like, okay, well, all of my work has to be about, like, X, Y, Z. Like, it's definitely will influence the way that I make work the, you know, how it's influencing it to this degree, I'm not sure because I really haven't made a ton of work, again, since George Floyd has been murdered. But, you know, it'll definitely be something I'm keeping in mind. But if anything, I think it's, it's more of a signal to be more of yourself, to do the things that like make you happy, especially as a black person, like do the work that makes you happy, do the work that makes you satisfied, do the work that makes you feel like you're doing something important and not for other people because on the street you're just another black person to them you know so why go through your life trying to please other people and make work for other people when you can just make work for yourself and whether or not that's police brutality or not i encourage all black artists and all black people just to do what makes you happy because like who else is trying to make us happy other than ourselves right now if that makes sense 
Well, and I, totally. And thank you for being so open. Um, yeah. What's going on and how it's affecting your practice and how the day-to-day -day goes. Cause I think that's really important for folks um, everywhere to hear and think about. And the onus can't be just on black artists to be kind of speak or black individuals to be speaking um, and doing in the moment but it's got to come from each individual. And you said the collage, some of the idea behind the collages was for the first time you making the work that you wanted to make rather than right. the outside influences or school or whatever else. And, and that the power and the energy is going to come through because yeah. you yourself first, but then you share it. And that's kind of the power of, of the visual. Um, for sure. Cause whether or not like I fail or I'm successful in like what I want to do in my career, like why fail? not doing the stuff that I want to do, you know, like, and that's, I think, what a lot of this is put in perspective, like, I can literally just go to the store and be shot, like, by police, like, I can, it doesn't matter what degree you have, it doesn't matter what you look like, it doesn't matter how you talk, it doesn't matter what respectability politics you adhere to, like, you can be killed by police at any moment, so what I promise myself is that I'm going to completely and, like, a hundred percent do the work that makes me happy because if I get killed tonight trying to see my boyfriend or going or tomorrow like I don't want my legacy or whatever I leave behind to be a portfolio of stuff that didn't make me happy you know that's kind of morbid but you Amen. Know. no 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 not at all and I want to be um, cognizant of time and also someone asked a question although I think we've been yeah. talking about the answer uh, for the, at least the last 20 minutes but they wrote in, Rakim, can you speak to how institutions often pigeonhole black artists and other artists of color as social justice work? And how is this damaging both to the work and the artists? And do you have any ideas on how to move forward? As I said, I think we've already been answering that question, but I want yeah. to ask those who have written in and if you want to have any other things to share beyond what you just said. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'll answer this pretty quickly because I know I, I talk a lot, but um, I think that, um, it is really damaging and it's frustrating and annoying because I think that a lot of times black artists are, yeah, put into this thing about like, okay, well, how does this relate back to slavery? Or how does this relate back to your oppression? Or how does this relate back to this? And I find that really annoying because I curated the show um, called Blackstract at my job not too long ago. And then my first show that I did in 2017 was called white artists don't have to make work, work about racial identity. And it was really kind of about like how black people are pigeonholed into these categories, you know? And it's like, I think that if a black person wants to make work, of, like wants to make abstract work and that has nothing to do with like, you know, the political moment or like the times, like they should be allowed to do that because it's, you know, other artists aren't questioned about that. like white artists aren't questioned about you know well like how does this affect your heritage or whatever and i and i find that limiting as hell and i think what needs to happen is a lot of gallerists a lot of curators and a lot of um people that have positions of power need to like let black people in the room i'm i'm, I'm not gonna say that it's up to them to fix the problem i mean it is but like they need to let black people in the room and not give black people a seat at the table, but they need to, but like, and I don't want to say that like, oh, like black people need to be given something, but like we need to be given the same opportunities that everyone else has been given and let black people show like what they can do. Like the work I'm making in terms of the collage stuff isn't about racial oppression all the time. Like it's about mental health and I should be allowed to do that. And so allowing black artists the, re the ability to make work about whatever they want to make, regardless of what they look like or where they come from is paramount. And it's like, it, it's, it's almost, I think it's difficult for people to think or understand that because they don't understand how black people operate, you know, like we're, we're human beings. Like we're not like this weird subset of something. We're human beings that feel and think the same way that everyone else does. Therefore, we need to be treated the same way everyone else does. And that's how I think we move past, or not even move past, but we recognize some of it. Like, I know that there's a lot, like, you know, this is only a 45 minute conversation, so I can't go into like institutional, like boardrooms and stuff like that. But, you know, I think on, on a general sense, like that's the kind of stuff that needs to be done and allow black people to be human beings. Like, stop treating them <laughs> as if they're like this subset of human, like, we are a, I am a human being and I deserve to be treated as such. And I can't remember what 
video said it, not only do I deserve it, but I demand it, you know? And like, that's what I think should be done. Like black people should just be like, I am a human. I accept nothing less than being treated, you know? I accept nothing less than that. If anything, I expect more. <laughs> so that's kind of how that's kind of how I feel about that. And whoever asked that, we can maybe talk about that a little bit more privately because I think that that's a whole other webinar in and of itself. You know, <laughs> definitely no. And and there's way more that we could talk about. Um, yeah, for hours on this subject and more of your work and each collage and how it's thoughtfully put together and and mm -hmm. what what folks get out of it. But maybe for now, we'll we'll wrap up. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for, one, being a part of this project. It's been really an honor to get to know you and have these conversations through the project. And I hope they continue kind of beyond um, and into the future. And um, yeah, no, it's just, uh, I hope everyone here today has really enjoyed the conversation. And it gives us all something to think about and work, and work towards. And um, the fight is long and we all need to keep fighting it in the ways we can. So I want to just say thanks. Well, yeah, and thank you for having me, you know, um, it's, I'm like, you know, if you get into it and you just get like, yeah, but, you know, thank you so much for having me and, you know, thank you for everyone listening and, you know, I hope that we were able to have a good discussion for you. Oh, thank you guys. Um, you know, and I'm really passionate about this stuff and, you know, feel free to message me outside of this conversation and we can talk about it and, um, what I'll say to everyone listening is, you know, like, we've been all posting and saying Black Lives Matter, but, like, Think about how you've been treating and how you affect the black people in your life and really think about what that means and like, you know, how we can do better. And, um, you know, thank you all. And that's, that's really all I can ask. And thank you guys all for being supportive. And I very much appreciate it. Yeah. And it's a continued effort. And uh, I look forward, hopefully some of you are in Los Angeles are able to come and have these conversations, at least in person in the exhibition, whenever it's able to safely open. So this yeah. is the end, but just the beginning. Um, Definitely. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>